So we've got a good one today. We're going to be making Coq au Vin, which is a classic French preparation of chicken braised in red wine. Sometimes preparing something like this can seem a bit intimidating for novice cooks, but I think by the end of this video you'll have a better idea of how the preparation works and you'll probably want to give it a shot. Honestly, this is one of those dishes that even if you mess it up, it's still going to be really good. And of course, as always with my videos, we're going to go into a bit of the history behind this dish as well. So what do you say we get to it? Now there are quite a few pre-preparation ideas out there for Coca Van, and I've tried several of these through the years, but the one that I've landed on that seems to result in the most flavorful, tender, and juiciest chicken starts with a brine. So let's get that going. Okay, to make the brine, we're going to start by filling a large mixing bowl with one gallon of water, and to that we're going to add one half cup of kosher salt and one half cup of granulated sugar. Then give the bowl a good whisking until it all becomes dissolved, and you could add various herbs, garlic, or peppercorns if you choose, but all you really need here is the salt and the sugar. Now for braising recipes like this one, you want to use cuts of meat that are a little bit more sturdy and have a bit of connective tissue. Chicken legs and chicken thighs are ideal for this one. Chicken breasts would likely dry out, so save those for a different recipe. So this is what we're going with today. I'm going to go with four legs and four thighs in this batch. You could add more, but be aware that if your pot's not big enough, you're likely to overload it. All right, that's it for that step. Now it's ready to go into the fridge for a day. Okay, now the chicken has been sitting in the brine for 24 hours, so that portion of the recipe is now complete. So let's take it out of the fridge and move on to the next step. So we can go ahead and drain this out, and the next step is to soak it in wine overnight. So I'm going to use a cheap boxed wine for this. You can use whatever red wine you like, but there's no need to spend a ton of money on this. Go cheap. The dish started as a peasant dish. It's good to keep it that way. Okay, so it's been 12 hours now, so let's get this thing out of the refrigerator, see what it looks like, and get it ready to cook the rest of the way. And yes, as you can see, we have purple chicken here. That is entirely normal, that is how it's supposed to look. Now this process may seem like a lot of work, but it's honestly not that much work. Most of it is just putting it in the refrigerator and sort of letting it do its thing. And this whole process is worth it in the end, trust me on that. All right, well that's enough of that shit, we finally got that out of the way. So how about we actually cook some fucking food now? You know the thing you actually tuned into the video for? Okay, the first thing we need to do is to pat the chicken dry with paper towels. Don't skip this step because if you do, the chicken will stick to the pot and it won't brown properly. And when you're finished with that, go ahead and set it aside and we're going to get our bacon cut up next. The bacon here is not only going to serve as the garnish for the finished product, but the rendered fat from the bacon itself will be used for the searing of the chicken pieces. What I'm going for here is a medium-ish dice, or squares that are roughly one half inch in size. Place them into the pot on the stove top and set the burner between low and medium. A slow render is ideal here. Once the pieces become brown and crisp up, remove them from the pot and if there isn't enough rendered fat from the bacon, add a little bit of oil or if you have it, chicken fat. Bring the heat up between medium and high and place the chicken pieces into the pot one at a time. My pot did become slightly crowded, but as long as the heat remains high enough, it's not a big deal. If you're unsure whether your pot is hot enough or not, the pieces should be sizzling and not bubbling. If your pot is bubbling, that means the chicken is simmering and not sauteing as it should be. The chicken will then not only stay to the pot but it won't brown properly and you won't achieve the desired color or flavor with the chicken or the sauce which is made in the same pot. So this is a very important step to get right. The good thing though is that troubleshooting becomes easier the more you know about these things. And once all the chicken pieces have become browned, go ahead and remove them from the pot and we can build our sauce. And for that, start with two tablespoons of flour and one tablespoon of tomato paste. Cook that up for a minute or so and lightly toast it, but keep stirring it because it can burn easily. Then we can incorporate our liquids, which in this case is 12 ounces of red wine and 12 ounces of chicken stock, or a cup and a half of each. Go ahead and switch over to a whisk, add a pinch of salt, and continue whisking until the sauce reaches a full boil so the flour can properly thicken the sauce. Unfortunately, a lot of YouTube videos incorrectly say to bring flour thickened sauces only to a simmer. The flour must reach 212 degrees to fully thicken the sauce. Once you've reached that point, go ahead and throw the chicken back into the pot, drop the heat down to low, and once things sort of calm down to a simmer, throw a lid on it, and this part's going to take about 30 minutes, so let's go ahead and go over the history of Coco Van. So as with many classic dishes, the origins of coca vin are largely unknown. 
One theory goes way back to Julius Caesar and the Gallic Wars which took place over 2,000 years ago between the people of Gaul and the Romans, an area of land which France, Germany, Switzerland, and Belgium are currently located. The theory goes that in the year 52 BC, the king of Gaul had a rooster sent to Caesar to mock him, and Caesar responded by having that rooster cooked in wine. There is no historical verification of this story whatsoever, so take that as you will. Now moving forward to the 1800s, there is a recipe for poulet au vin blanc, or chicken and white wine that appears in the 1864 book Cookery for English Households. Moving forward beyond that, the first recipe actually titled Coq au vin didn't appear until 1913 in the book Les Art de Bien Manger, and I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. It's a book by Edward Richardin, and this recipe claims that it was actually passed down from the 1500s. Now one difference between these older recipes and the modern recipes you see is the older ones were specifically designed for older roosters, which were sort of past their prime for breeding capabilities, and the recipes called for the roosters to be soaked in wine for several days in order to tenderize them. Now modern chickens aren't as tough as them, so we don't need to soak them for as long, as this whole thing is mainly done for flavor these days. Now looking into this, there does appear to be a lot of people and places that claim the origin of coca vin as their own, and there probably is some truth to a lot of these given they all probably have their own unique variations. Today it seems to be most associated with the Burgundy region, which is why you see a lot of recipes that call for Burgundy wine, although a lot of other regions have their own varieties, such as the Alsace region, which uses Riesling, which is a white wine. Julia Child is the one, though, who probably deserves the credit for popularizing it in the modern era and in the West. It was featured pretty prominently in her TV shows and in her books, and people tuned into the shows and read the books, and that's how people found out about it. Well, anyway, that's it for that, so let's get back to it. Now, Coco Van can be served with any number of accompaniments. A lot of people like it with pasta, boiled parsley potatoes are traditional. Today, we're gonna be doing some roasted potatoes with these things. So this bag of potatoes is a mixture of Yukon Gold and Red Skin potatoes. Nothing special here, just cut them in half with a knife the long way, place them into a mixing bowl, add about a tablespoon of rendered chicken fat, olive oil or melted butter will also work if you don't have that, add a few pinches of salt and fresh cracked black pepper, toss everything together to get it all evenly coated, and arrange them cut side down on a sheet tray and place them into a 450 degree oven for 20 to 25 minutes. I am also using a piece of parchment paper which will help with sticking and make cleanup easier. Now that we have that in the oven, the chicken still has a bit of time left, so let's get our mushrooms ready. I'm using cremini mushrooms here, and all I'm doing is cutting them into quartered sections. You could also sub out other types of mushrooms if you want, that's up to you. And all we're doing here is briefly sauteing them, so add the mushrooms to a preheated pan set between medium and high, add a pinch of salt, and cook them for about five minutes until they get a bit of color and soften up a little. And you might be wanting to ask me the question, hey man, isn't braising supposed to be kind of a one-pot thing? Well, here in a minute we're going to see why I'm doing this separately. For now though, let's set these aside and let's check back in on our chicken. The chicken has been cooking for about 30 minutes, and it is fully cooked so we can remove it from the pot and strain our sauce into a more practical pot because it needs to reduce down by about half. Getting back to why I'm preparing the mushrooms separately, you could choose to go the one pot route and add the mushrooms after searing the chicken and build them directly into the sauce from the beginning, and that's entirely up to you and it still will be really good, but as you can see here, doing it this way gives us a chance to remove some of this shit and will make the sauce a bit more refined. Set it over medium heat and let's get our pearl onions ready. I'm using frozen ones because fresh ones are kind of a pain in the ass. They are available in most grocery stores, and the only thing we need to do with these is remove the tiny root section on the bottom, but be careful not to cut too high up into the onion, because we still want these onions to remain intact. Once you have all of those removed, set them aside, and let's check back in on our sauce. It is reduced down by about half, so give it a taste and add a bit of salt if you need to. You can go ahead and add the mushrooms into the sauce now, too. We can add the pearl onions here as well because frozen ones are already softened and don't really need any more cooking. So checking back on the potatoes, they've been in the oven for about 25 minutes and they have become soft and tender and the cut sides have taken on a little bit of browning. So the only thing we need to do with these things now is place them into a mixing bowl and toss them with a little bit of parsley. And as long as you have the sauce to the proper consistency, meaning that it's thick enough to cling to the chicken, we're ready to plate this whole thing up. Start by placing a few pieces of the chicken on one side of the plate, add a 
handful of our roasted potatoes onto the other, ladle a little bit of the sauce over the top of the chicken, and finally garnish with some parsley and a little bit of our bacon bits from earlier. I did forget to put the bacon bits on when filming this, so my bad on that. But with all of that, we've reached the end of the video, so thanks for tuning in, and see you next time.